On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Vanessa Klo, and I serve as the college's director of alumni relations. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with the College of Arts and Sciences and the Indiana University, regardless of your location. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's FIJIC presenter, Professor Emerita Patricia Foster from the IU Department of Biology. Professor Foster is a renowned scholar and teacher whose research focuses on mutational processes that drive changes in the genomes of microorganisms over time. A fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology the Ameri and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Professor Foster has written several articles in her retirement for the conversation about influenza, norovirus, smallpox, and chickenpox, all of which are caused by viruses. Following her presentation, Professor Foster will be joined by Caitlin Doucette, who is a fourth year PhD candidate in the Department of Biology. Under her advisor's direction, Dr. John Patton, Ms. Doucette researches the importance of RNA secondary structures throughout the life cycle of rotavirus, a pathogenic virus that causes severe GI symptoms in infants and young children. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion. Simply click on the Q&A tab located in your webinar toolbar. Hover your mouse over the screen and your toolbar should appear. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Foster for her presentation. Thank you. Hi, right, hey, thank you, Vanessa, for that nice introduction. Uh, and as uh, you have heard and you heard for, uh, I'm going to talk about chickenpox virus. And thank you very much for uh, joining me on this. Except my, well, there we go. Okay. So I was delighted last month to see this um, Google Doodle honoring uh, the birthday of Dr. Uh, Takahashi. Uh, he was the person who first developed a vaccine against the chickenpox. And, uh, and, and in 1984, it was declared to be the best vaccine that was available at the time. And the ones that we use today, in fact, are derivatives of his original vaccine. So chickenpox, of course, is highly contagious. I, I'm going to, I'll have a few cute pictures, but I chose ones where the kids were not totally covered in, in blisters, so it wouldn't look so gruesome. But chickenpox is highly contagious uh, prior to when the vaccine was uh, widely available. About 100% of the U.S. population had chickenpox by the age of 15. Part of the reason it's so highly contagious is that kids actually are infected four or five days before the, um, the blisters appear. And then, of course, the blisters themselves are just teeming with viruses. Um, but uh, a few months ago, the, SD, uh, the CDC uh, released a, well, actually they didn't release it, but it, they made a, um, a uh, report that said that, that the Delta ver version of COVID was more um, transmissible than chickenpox. Well, there were a couple of epidemiologists who took exceptions to that, and they made this chart showing uh, how many people an infected person is likely to infect. Um, this is called the r naught, and um, it's a common... Um, uh, measure of infectivity. And you can see here is the Delta strain at 7 and chicken pox up here at 10. So chicken pox is more uh, infectious. I did a little back of the envelope calculation about Omicron and it came in about 8 here. Now I think the BA2 um, strain of Omicron may be pushing that more towards the chicken pox. But of course the clear winner is up here, uh, measles. Um, so, although chickenpox is considered to be very mild, uh, with few consequences, it does have, it can have some severe consequences, particularly for children who are immunocompromised. So prior to the introduction of the vaccine, out of the millions of uh, kids that got chickenpox every year, over 10,000 were hospitalized and 100 to 150 died every year. And of course, after having chickenpox, about one in three people will develop shingles at some point in their life. This is shingles. It's pretty horrible. Uh, and th for people who live to 85, about 50% of them will have had it by that time. Well, this is what 
the virus looks like? Oh, I should point out that the official name of the virus is varicella zoster. Uh, varicella actually means little variola. Variola is the virus that causes smallpox. However, the two viruses really are not very closely related at all. Zoster um, is derived from the Greek for belt. As is, and actually shingles, which is what we call it, is derived from the Latin for belt. The, the uh, chicken pox and shingles are really only English speakers uh, use that. The rest of the world calls the, calls the chicken pox varicella and they cause uh, shingles zoster. This is the viral capsid. This is a very, very high resolution and it's also false, false colored, of course. Um, just to show you that th this is the protein coat that within which the viral um, genome lies. And this is an illustration of what the virus looks like. This is the coat here, and this is the genome, which is double-stranded DNA, which is the same type of genome that we have. So unlike the coronavirus, which is single-stranded RNA, so uh, DNA tends to be much more stable than RNA. Around the capsid is this coat, uh, which is called the tegument, which contains a lot of the proteins that the virus is going to use in order to infect cells. And then on the outside of that is a membrane, which is actually divide, derived from the host cell, and sticking out are uh, proteins. Uh, the, because it's double-stranded DNA, and because it's a very complicated, a complex virus, it copies its genome very, very accurately. So the, the uh, rate at which changes are made when it copies, which we call mutations, the mutation rate, is probably about 200-fold lower than it is for coronavirus. Um, so that means that this virus evolves very, very slowly. This is what it looks like inside a cell. These are the capsids. And then when it comes out, here it is coated with the tegument and with the membrane around it. And I just stuck this in. I don't want to dwell on it, but it's just to show that uh, the virus actually goes in and it, it um, copies its genome inside the nucleus of the cell that's infecting. Now, um, the virus, the chickenpox virus, belongs to a large, very widespread um, family of viruses called herpes. And what you're looking at here is essentially the family tree of, a very simplified, of, of the herpes viruses. And the way this is derived, the scientists, they, they look at the genomes or the genes of various viruses that are existing today, and they deduce uh, what the path would be uh, leading to each one of these from the other. So one thing about, in addition to the, um, uh, the chickenpox virus having a very slow mutation rate, it also tends to be specific to a host. That is, it, it, although the jumps have her, happened and have happened in the past, they're relatively rare. So it's, it's ha the viruses have evolved to infect a specific host. So that has an important um, uh, a consequence for being able to figure out their evolution. Now, this viral tree does not have a timeline on it. We don't have ancient DNA to look at, not for this virus anyway. But what we do have is the host and a very good evolutionary tree for the host because they're animals and we have a fossil record. So a scientist can, can correlate those two things, the, the viral um, family tree with the host evolution. And that's what this is. Now, don't freak out. I know this is really complex, but I'm just going to point out a couple of things about it. So this is the um, family tree of the animal kingdom. And the blue are, is the family tree of the viruses. But this, of course, is put on a scale going back millions of years. The, the yellow lines are actually the jumps that have happened in the past. But what I want to point out is, well, first off, here's humans down here, um, that if you look uh, at the oldest uh, lines going back, it's, which are actually the turtle um, herpes virus, that is actually 200 million years ago. So what that means is that the ancient ancestor of the virus that eventually gave rise to the chickenpox virus was existed 200 million years ago, which is the time of the dinosaur, dinosaur. So it coexisted with the dinosaurs. So I want to just concentrate on uh, this box down here, which are um, the primates. So 
um, these are the apes up here and these are the monkeys down here and um, if you look at these two here's here is home here here we are and this little monkey here and the reason I'm pointing it out is that this is the, the chicken um, um, pox virus and this is its closest relative now our closest relative is the chimpanzee but the closest relative to the chicken pox virus actually infects a monkey so if you go back through the line, you discovered that the monkeys and the, um, the apes diverged 23 million years ago. So this means that this virus has been co-evolving with us for 23 million years. So how did that happen? How could a virus, a pathogenic virus, maintain itself in a host for, uh, well, I'm not, you know, the same, I mean, the, uh, the evolving host for 23 million years? Well. The answer is probably because of the different phases that the uh, virus goes through. So first you have chicken pox, which a um, you know, um, person inhales, it gets dis dispersed in the blood, and then it pops out on the skin. Right? And then the, the skin, the, the blisters heal, but the virus doesn't go away. What it does is it, it travels into to what are known as the dorsal root ganglia. Now, this particular um, illustration shows the virus, the little red dots are the virus, traveling in the nerve. That may not be true. It may be it just, it's in, it's in the bloodstream and then it's, a, it's attracted to, to the nerves. Anyway, it hangs out in the dorsal root ganglia, which contain these, um, the nu nuclei of the, of the nerve cells. And these are tangles of these um, nuclei that are um, dispersed up and down the spinal cord. So it goes into what's called a latent state, and so it really isn't replicating, it's not um, growing mostly, and it just hangs out, and it, can, it will stay there for the rest of the person's life. Then, every once in a while, it will reactivate, travel along the neuron again, and then pop out along the parts of the scale that was actually serviced by that neuron. This usually only happens at one, one place at a time. And that's what is shingles. So what does that mean in terms of the evolution of this virus? So when you think about, um, you know, people, just, just concentrate on people um, or their predecessors, living in small groups as hunter-gatherers, right? So, so a chicken pox happens. If somebody comes from a different group, carries chicken pox in, it happens, there's an outbreak, everybody in that group is going to get chicken pox. Well, chicken pox gives lifetime immunity, probably because of that latency state. So nobody's going to get chicken pox again. So the virus would go extinct, except for that latency state. So it hangs out in the adults. New children are born. They are naive. Somebody gets shingles, those blisters are infectious, they give the kids chicken pox, and the whole cycle starts again. So that was a theory that I'd like, I think it's a very good theory. It was, um, it was propagated by um, Dr. Charles Gross um, back in um, 2012. Okay, so I thought this would be a nice time for a joke. Um, I want to introduce you to the shortest poem in the English language. It was written by Strickland W. Gillian, and it's called Lines on the Antiquity of Microbes. And here it is, Adam Haddam. Okay, so I want to go back now to talk about the disease itself. Um, so as I already said, you have your original chicken pox virus, and then you have this latency state that sets up in the ganglia. Now, as, as everybody thinks that chicken pox is, you know, is fairly mild and, and also, you know, people used to have chicken, probably some of you in the audience participated in chicken pox uh, parties because it was widely known that the older a child got, the worse the, uh, the chicken pox was going to be. So parents would like to get their children over it early so they would have parties and everybody would get chicken pox. But there are complications. Here are a few of them. And like I mentioned before, some kids do die. And in particular, kids who are immunocompromised. And one of the real reasons that the, uh, the vaccine uh, was, people believe that the vaccine should be given, even for this mild disease, is because kids in about uh, the 80s or so, it, it was you know, 
kids could get cured of childhood cancers by, with uh, chemotherapy, and then they'd die of chickenpox. And so, you know, it was really it was really a terrible thing. So this is what happened when the vaccine was introduced. It was first licensed about 1981. And you can see right away cases started going down because kids were getting it. And then um, in um, 1995, the CDC recommended be part of the usual uh, childhood schedule of immunization. And the cases just dropped. Now, there was an uptick here because there can be um, breakout cases that, you know, even vaccinate the kids can get chicken pox. And so uh, the CDC recommended a booster at that point. And that's what happens today is that kids get two shots. These are the deaths. They're a lot more variable, but they came right down um, after the uh, vaccine was introduced. Now, the chicken pox vaccine is very safe. It is a live weakened strain, what we call the attenuated strain, of the, of the Baricella uh, virus. And like the original virus, it established a latent state. And that is probably why it gives long-lasting uh, protection. At least so far, I mean, it's been less than 30 years since it was widely introduced. But it's hoped that like the chicken pox inf uh, infection, that the virus may actually give lifelong immunity. It's very safe. Um, the, um, the longest study, or the biggest study by Merck was out of 60 million doses, uh, only 0.03% had adverse uh, um, reactions. So that's like one in every 3,000 uh, 3, doses. And most of these reactions were mild, only a very few of them were serious. And in contrast, the serious consequences of chicken pox is much higher, about 200-fold more frequently than after vaccination. However, because the vaccine is a live virus, it can cause chicken pox. I mean, some children after getting it will get chicken pox, usually just at the site of the inoculation. And it also can cause shingles, uh, but at rates that are much, much lower than the normal virus. However, because it's a live virus, it's not considered safe to give to immunocompromised children or adults. Okay, shingles um, is, has, um, can be initiated by anything that um, reduces the effectiveness of the immune system. And this can be age, illness, or chronic stress. And um, the reason this happens is this is a theory, by the way. One of the reasons that I'm saying this is a theory, we don't really know, is because there aren't any really good animal models for, for chicken pox because it's so host-specific. So there are obviously animals have a similar virus, but they're not necessarily getting the same disease. Plus, you don't really do, uh, you know, ex you don't really dissect out nerves out of, uh, out of a human, a live human, and see whether they got viruses. So really, most of the re work on that has been done with cadavers. But anyway, this is a theory that, okay, you get chicken pox, and this is the level of immunity going up the, uh, the y-axis. This is all, you know, this is all illustration. Um, so you get chicken pox, and you have an immune, pretty good immunity. The virus in the, in the latent state will periodically activate. And because you have immunity, you can beat it back and beat it back. If, you, if an adult gets exposed to chicken pox, that could boost up the immunity again. And, but you beat it back and you can beat it back and you can beat it back. Eventually, because you're getting of age or illness or stress, the, the immunity drops too low and then, be, uh, and then boom, you have shingles. So that is the theory. Um, now, complications, of course, can also occur in shingles. Here's a whole list of them. But the most common complication, about 15% of patients will get post-herpetic neuralgia. And this is a pretty miserable state. If you've ever had it or you've ever known anybody who had it, you know that this is really miser a misery. It is a neuralgia, it's a, a pain, a burning sharp pain that goes on for months. And it's, it's touch sensitive. Um, and so it's, you know, and it, it, it can go on for years actually. And the, and the pain is quite severe. 
and there's really no treatment for this. It goes up fairly sharply with age. This is the, um, the rate of the uh, shingles with age, and this is the rate of the, um, everybody calls it P, uh, PHN. There is now an effective vaccine against shingles. Back in 2006, they developed one that was called Zostavax, which was essentially the same as the, uh, as the uh, vaccine for chickenpox, just at a higher dose. And if you look down here at um, the clinical trials, you can see that it really wasn't that good. And then also it declined with time. So people, you know, were getting uh, shingles again. But now, since 2017, there's actually a much better one. It's what's called a component uh, vaccine. So it's not the whole virus. It's just the protein, one of the proteins that appears on the surface of the virus. And that's given with what's called an adjuvant, which is a mixture of kind of goopy, soapy stuff that uh, stimulates the um, immune system. And you can see that actually it's much it is much more effective and so far at least after nine years there's been no decline and it's also effective if people get shingles it's effective against PHN. And this vaccine is very safe. Um, the adverse uh, reactions are just local pain, swelling, some people get a little uh, um, fever. I do have to tell you it really hurts, the shot itself. <laughs> Um, it is safe to give to immunocompromised people. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you there is a weak association of the shot with Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, which is a, an, another type of a neuralgia. And it's not very, uh, not very much. It's, you know, like here, three to six excess cases per million injection. But the FDA concluded that uh, it, there is an association, but not enough of, to include that it's actually causal. Okay, so I'm pretty much at the end of my talk. Um, I have some take-home lessons. Uh, first, that childhood chickenpox can have uh, consequences, serious consequences, especially for immunocompromised children. The chickenpox vaccine is good for to prevent about 90% of the cases. Importantly, the herd immunity among children, like in school, uh, will protect the vulnerable children, and it's safer than chicken pox. The other is that people who have had chicken pox are at high risk for developing shingles. Shingles is pretty awful, awful of itself, uh, but PHN is terrible, and there's also other possible consequences. It can be prevented by at least 90% by vaccination, and the vaccine is safe. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about, and uh, so now I'll be, I'll turn it over to, um, to Caitlin, and uh, we can answer questions that you might have. All right, thanks, Pat. Um, <clears throat> so we have a couple questions in the chat, so I'll do those first. Um, so first question from Anonymous, uh, how many people get shingles twice? Of uh, some. I mean, you're, you're boosted up your immune system some when you, um, you have, you've had shingles, but you're usually getting older and older, and so it starts declining again. So it can happen that you have, I don't know what the number is, I would say probably less than 10%, but it can happen. Okay, and then we have another question from Claire. Um, should the chickenpox vaccine help guard against shingles? We don't know. Notice okay. that those people are, that the people who got vaccinated are only about 30 years old. <laughs> Yeah, I am, I am definitely one of those people that remembers the chicken pox parties and I am too old to have gotten the vaccine. So uh, I definitely am with you on that one. Okay, so then we have another question from uh, Linda who mentions that they have had shingles three times. I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, in between the second and third time they had their first vaccination. Uh, I'm assuming the shingles vaccination in that case. Um, each time I was given an antiviral drug. Then after the third time I got a newer vaccine. Um, do I need to be concerned about being more susceptible to COVID despite being vaccinated and boosted? Do you mean because you got a shingles vaccine, you worried about being susceptible to COVID? That was that yeah. was the question. That was the question. Correct. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, if they not, if I wouldn't think so. Um, I'm not sure. I, I've never heard it go that way. There's some 
There's some cases of people getting shingles after getting the COVID vaccine. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's it. I think that we need bigger. I mean, nobody does a clinical trial to find out something like that. It's just doctors report. Oh yeah, you know, I had a patient who got it. So it's not entirely clear. It's not just a coincidence. But I, yeah, I, I don't think there's that much relationship between the the two viruses. Okay, so I think um, I think it's less about the two viruses and seeing if there's um, any connection between the virus, the, the virus. Vaccine, but more more to do with if you're if you get vaccinated and you have another infection after that, are you then more or should you be more concerned, say for the COVID vaccine? Should this person maybe be more concerned about whether or not they're going to need more boosters because they got shingles despite having the vaccine? Is I think I think what Linda's getting at. I just. <laughs> I'm afraid I just don't know. Um, you know, and, and also, I, I don't think it, it is possible that people, as they get, you know, depending on when they got the first um, shingles vaccine, as they get older, it may, be, it may be that people start recommending a booster for that too. I mean, we just don't have enough information on how long that uh, immunity is going to last. We have, we have a 10-year window right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Okay, so um, let's see, we have a couple more. Um, uh, how does the chickenpox vaccine, I'm sorry, Alex asked, how does the chickenpox vaccine being a live virus make the immunity last longer um, than say not a live attenuated virus? It's because I think because it sets up this latency state. And so that's constantly, you know, like it'll, it'll be reactivating very slightly, very mildly every once in a while and just keep the immunity boosted up. I believe okay, that's so the way it works. I'll selfishly ask you a question that I had because it kind of fits with that. So because uh, the varicella vaccine is a live attenuated virus, the people that receive that vaccine will also have latent latency, um, just like, you know, someone like me that just had chicken pox when I was four. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Awesome. And like I say, we still don't know whether it'll um, activate as shingles later in life either. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions about uh, the age at which people can get shingles. Um, so uh, Carol asked, what, what causes a younger person to get shingles? My daughter caught it at 15. And I'll add that I knew someone that had it freshman year of college. Mm -hmm. so, it, it happens. I mean, it's all about the immune system, right? It's about uh, freshman year in college, probably you're under a lot of stress. You know, uh, it, or an illness or, you know. My husband got it when he took over as um, chair of his department. It's, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, it happens. It's, you know, it's all about how the immune system is, is you know, reacting to the virus, whether there are enough, you know, um, I, it's, mostly, it's mostly innate immunity. So whether your T cells are ready to, you know, to take care of it. So. Okay. I mean, sometimes children can get it, right? I mean, you know, little kids can get it. Okay, so let's see. Peter has a great question. Um, that initial infection with shingles appears to occur by the respiratory droplets. However, the fluid from a shingles blister is also considered to be contagious. How do these two methods compare in terms of contagiousness? Uh, I don't think he means shingles, though. It's the chicken, chicken pox you get from respiration. Yes, yes. I, think, I okay. do think that yeah. is what they meant, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, I, I mean, this is debated in the literature. Um, I think the fact that um, the, the respiratory infection occurs before symptoms means that that's a more common way to pass it because the, in order to get it from the blisters, you would have to, you know, touch it and do something on your face, right? Although I, I remember there, there's a case, I read a case where uh, somebody with shingles gave it to uh, chicken pox to his children, even though he was isolating. So, so it was... There was some sort of airborne thing from the blisters to the kids. So, you know, I think, I, yeah, so that, that's the best I can answer that. Wow, okay. It's an old disease, so it figured out a lot of ways to get us, I guess. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, I'll do Scott. Uh, Scott Michaels has a question. So great talk, Pat. Thank uh, you, Mike. you know Thanks, how the Scott. virus is weakened for use in the vaccine? Is it genetic mutation or heat treated? No, it, it was passage. It was serial passage through um, cell lines. And, uh, you know, that, I mean, we have, the, we know the genome, but we don't know what the, the, the genes do. So 
it's you can't really answer the genetic question but it was it was serial passage yeah i definitely that is that is a at least for the virus i work on that is a very common way to get attenuated virus also uh all right so catherine asks um what is the incidence of severe reactions to the shingrix vaccine and then what is the current recommendation for this the shingrix vaccine in people who have received the other uh zoster back oh that's a very good question um i don't know that um i think what i showed you the um the, the, the low incidence of, of uh, Guillain-Barre, um, I think it's like the, the worst um, adverse effect that it has. Other than that, I think it's very low. I mean, just some people you get, you get a fever for a couple of days and, you know. Um, but yeah, the CDC is recommending that you get the Shingrits vaccine if, if you've had chicken pox, if you've had shingles, or if you've had the other vaccine. So okay, they say, just do it. Okay, great. You answered another question that was in here. So there's a question about if the chicken, if people that never had the chicken pox should get the shingles vaccine. The answer is get the vaccine. <laughs> yeah, because you say you never had chicken pox, but are you sure? Okay, let's see. Um, there's some wonderful alumni in the audience. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gary asked, is there any connection between climate change and chicken pox? Um, I think indirectly, um, it turns out that um, people in warm climates, um, this is, you know, leaving aside vaccination, people in warm climates tend to get the chicken pox at a later age, like more like when they're teenagers. Um, now that could be because the strain, there are actually five different, what we call clads of, um, but strains of the chicken pox virus that are circulating in the human population. It could be that, that the strain is doing better at the higher temperature. And, um, you know, so it, that's what, it isn't that, it isn't their physiology, it's the strain's physiology. But yeah, so it's possible with the temperature warming that, that something like that could happen. It's like the, the, the disease could shift the age spectrum. Yeah. So that's all I, that's all I know about that. Okay, interesting. So we might see, especially in the warmer southern parts of the U.S., there might start to be some some changes in the strains that you're seeing. Interesting. Um, that actually, so there aren't any other questions in the chat unless I, oop, we just got one. So never mind. I was going to ask another question, but I'll go with uh, Ted's question. So Ted uh, is a 72-year-old healthy male who has contracted mumps, measles, shame pox, rubella, Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, the virus that never got a name. Oh my gosh, Ted, you. The virus that never got a name is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, oh, I, I don't think there's a vaccine for that one. <laughs> no. Uh, and so they ask, do I have a more durable immunity than my grandchildren will as they age? Well, okay. That's an, it, it's an interesting question about whether actually getting diseases is, gives you better immunity than getting a vaccinated for them, right? I think that's sort of the basis of that of that question. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, and it may be because when well, it, it sort of depends on what kind of vaccination you get. So, so a live a live virus vaccination is more like getting the disease, and what I mean by that is that your immune system is seeing the whole virus, and so you may get um, you know a, make antibodies at that are, you know, that can attack more of the virus than if you get like the, the single protein in the Shinrix or the single, um, the single protein that is, is the uh, Moderna and the, um, and the Pfizer vaccine. Um, but that isn't necessarily true because the flu vaccine is the same, you know, it, it's, it's an antibody to one protein, <laughs> just as if the rest of the virus wasn't there. So I think that's a hard question. I think you sh you should you should go ahead and get the Cendrix vaccine. Okay, awesome. As I say to everybody, you you just don't want to get shingles. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a fun time. Definitely not. Um, and then Peter just has a comment to add that he would advise that uh, their patients, uh, their phys uh, physician, and they would advise their patients that even though they never had chickenpox symptoms, it is almost inevitable that they had chickenpox in a subclinical form that cleared before the rash developed. So if you think you didn't have it, you probably did, but you just didn't know it. So mm -hmm. good for you. Yeah. I definitely remembered the oatmeal baths. <laughs> so uh, great. 
I remember, I remember my parents, uh, we were driving across the country, we were moving to California, and my parents were sneaking me in and out of uh, motel rooms. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a little hard to hide that one, for sure. Um, so Thomas asks, are there any associations between a person's genetics and their susceptibility to or the severity of shingles? Don't know. Okay, yep. I feel like that is the, the case with a lot of viruses. We just don't don't quite know enough about them, uh, how they interact with our genetics. Is, mm -hmm. whew, a lot of, we're adding in a lot of um, factors into that equation. Um, so the one thing, I, so we don't have any more questions in the chat. So I'm just going to start asking you stuff and then I'll, I'll go back once, uh, once there's more in there. Um, so what I did notice in uh, reading some some of the things that we had talked about before this uh, this lovely seminar is that the rate of shingles vaccination is actually a lot lower than it is for chickenpox. So chickenpox is over ninety five percent of children, whereas the uh, shingles vaccine I think was around thir between thirty and forty percent. So is there a reason? Is it just because when you're a kid you're kind of on this routine of getting vaccination, so you're more likely to go do it, or is there another reason? No, I think that's true. I think you you know. Um... 80 year olds don't go to school, so they don't have to get the vaccine. But I think it also, I think doctors haven't really understood that there's this new vaccine that's much better than the old one. Um, you know, I mean, I was told to get the old one, and but uh, you know, I think a lot of doctors thought, well, it's not that good. You know, um, but then you know, then Shingrix is really a, a vast improvement. I think I think doctors should uh, step up and and really start telling their patients to to get it. And the CDC recommends anybody over 50. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty, I mean, definitely pretty young. People that yeah. probably have kids and are being exposed to a lot of things yeah. all the time. Um, so uh, let's see. I had, a, uh, again, based on uh, what we had talked about kind of before, so I'm a little, I'm cheating a little bit. But um, one of the things that was mentioned is the evolution of the virus um, and the fact that uh, there are some at least double-stranded DNA viruses that they have found going back to the dinosaurs. So um, do we think dinosaurs had herpes? I would not be surprised. Um, it's, I don't see how they could have missed because reptiles had it. I mean, the reptiles still have it. Now, if you looked at the back at that chart, I mean, when I, first I thought, well, you know, birds get it and birds, you know, evolved from dinosaurs. So of course he did. But if you look at where the birds got it, it looks like it was a jump. So you know, like millions of years ago, but not 200 millions of years ago. So, uh, but it seems to me that it would be unlikely that the, that if turtles have it, that you know, dinosaurs probably had it too. Okay. There's no escape. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, some, there are, herp, there are herpes like viruses in insects. I mean, I haven't done any research on that, so I don't know exactly where they fit on the, you know, on the chart, but. Fascinating. I wonder, this is, again, wild speculation, and I wonder if there is some connection between species host jumping and whether or not <laughs> the mosquitoes are doing it somehow. But Yeah, it's possible. Well, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I was reading something about uh, why bats and birds, um, and some people think it's because they fly, and therefore they're able to, you know, to cover a um, broader geographic region and get closer to a diff different species and and that's when the why they are seem to be vectors for i mean not like insect vectors but vectors for passing viruses around oh sure yeah and i'm sure the social the sociality of each of those species uh, probably helps too because bats are all usually together mm -hmm. um all right so we got some more questions in the q a um so this one isn't so much of a question but uh carol wanted to mention that there's a cost for the shingles vaccine maybe that differs in people so i don't know if you i don't know if you have anything to say about that specifically. yeah okay yeah i paid it um but um and, uh, medicare will pay for it now okay yep i was gonna ask i was like is that covered now it is now yeah okay and i assume medicaid okay let's see ellen would like to know if uh if my uh, my birds get I think this is it says S V I S N I don't know if that's avian pox maybe just smelling yes, uh, smelling on their feet uh, is that chicken pox so do chickens get chicken pox I'm gonna go ahead and guess yes <laughs> <laughs> now, no one asked me why what what where the chicken pox name came from anyway I don't know anything about that um, that disease of birds so I can't answer that question okay okay uh, okay yes they did mean avian. 
Okay. Um, let's see. So Ted has another question. Uh, I had the Shingrix vaccine. My cost was one hundred and ninety dollars out of pocket. Oh dear, that was like fifty dollars more than I paid. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah, America. Uh, I could afford that, but some people cannot. Should it be covered by Medicare? I think we yeah, would go we, we yes. that. Yeah. All vaccinations should be covered. Well, they aren't, but that one is. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, and then David also mentions that medical Medicaid will pay Medicare and Medicaid. Sorry, will pay for it. So that is good to know. Um, oh, Patsy has a great question that I don't know if there's a real answer to, but um, Patsy would like to know where would the first virus have come from, the one that affected the dinosaurs. Oh, gee, you know, the evolution of viruses is just just a fascinating, fascinating thing. And it's, it's impossible to tell, I mean, to, to know, I know, even come from is a question you can't answer because there's essentially two theories of, the, of where viruses came from. One is that they were the original rep, replicating machines, and the other is that they were uh, uh, derived from their host cells right and you know and that people argue about that endlessly but it is a real, a really i mean i'm sort of on the viruses came first side of the Me too. <laughs> yeah, I, I figured you would be so so you know i mean and also the other thing is that uh viruses didn't all, all start, come from the same place i mean they probably were evolved several times from de novo um Anyway, so that's not really an answer to the question, except that I think that it's lost, you know, it's, there is no answer to the question. Right, they've been around so long, we just yeah. don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, again, there's, uh, I'll wait to see if more questions pop up. I think there's a little bit of a delay between people typing, so forgive me. Um, Ellen also says, great seminar. Thank you, Ellen. Oh, thank you. Um, so I think what I was gonna ask was whether or not, um, let me look at my questions. Oh no, now I've forgotten what I was gonna ask you. It was definitely more about dinosaurs, but I don't, oh yeah. So uh, I know that sometimes you can find evidence for viruses like influenza we know has been around and infecting humans for basically since we've existed. Same thing with herpes. Um, is it possible to, to actually look at skeletalized remains to see evidence of that? I don't know if that's a thing that would be preserved, but. Yeah, well, okay. I looked that up asking that very same question. And I can tell you that at this moment, the oldest uh, DNA from a virus that was isolated from a tooth uh, was uh, the, the person who died 31,000 years ago. Wow. Okay. okay. Now, that well, I was going to say there are uh, reports of older DNA, but I think those are things that are actually incorporated into the genomes of other organisms, not the actual virus itself. Um, so, but I think it's just a matter of looking. I mean, you know, there, nobody, uh, not that many people motivated to go out there and try to find ancient DNA, vi viral DNA. I was disappointed, I, you know, I wrote an article about smallpox, and I was disappointed that the oldest, you know, the oldest smallpox um, um, DNA is only like 2,000 years old. Wow. Yeah. And I think, you know, people just aren't looking hard enough. Yeah, it's got to be older than that. For yeah. sure. But I think the thing is looking in teeth is kind of is interesting because it's, it, it's you know, it's protected by the enamel. Yeah, you get some more D good usable DNA out of teeth than you would yeah. out of a, maybe a vertebra, which is where you might see more of that. Oh, by the way, that, that 31,000 years, it was an adenovirus. Oh, yes. Okay. Which it sounds like a very long time ago, but then you look at when... Yeah, uh, these viruses diverged, and it was well, 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 well before that. <laughs> um, uh, I, oh, so the other, this is kind of following up again. I'm just, I, 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 I'm one of the people that would like to go dig up, dig up some uh, graves and <laughs> figure out what viruses that people had a long, long time ago. Um, is there? Is there any um, evidence that you can actually look at environmental samples um, to find the virus? I don't know if it would be something that could be, you know, stored in like a permafrost. Yes. Is really the one that gets scary because that's the one that can melt and release things. But mm -hmm. I don't know if that would be a thing that would happen for a, a animal virus. Oh, I'm trying to think of um, the Iceman. Yeah, it's see. Yeah, did they get any, I can't remember if they got any uh, pathogens off of him or not. I believe um, they 
did, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But I think I think that they did. Yeah, but they're also. I mean, right, the two thousand year old um, smallpox was um, some from mummies that they weren't they weren't oh, uh, yeah. intentional mummies. They were bodies that had gotten mummified for some reason. Like a bog um, body. <laughs> yeah, like bog or something like that. So that's another possibility. But, uh, you know, the, I think there's something from mammoths, um, frozen mammoths that, that they've got, gotten some viruses out of them. Okay, cool. Yeah. This is my dream. I'll be able to do that someday. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and that, you know, there aren't that many environment, you know, uh, uh, field, field virus, viral virus. Yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to go out in the ocean and just scoop up all the viruses and figure out what's in there. Uh, okay, so Ted has another question. Um, which is worse, a novel virus, which we have no immunity, or a pathogenic bacteria, which has no known antibiotic treatment? Hard one. Well, see, here's a partial answer. M more people die of tuberculosis than any other um, microbial disease and we do have antibiotics but they don't work so that's sort of saying that the bacterial pa untreatable bacterial pathogen is worse but then you might ask yourself okay so six million people died of COVID already what if we had didn't have a vaccine yeah so I'm still gonna bet on the bacteria I think, yeah, I was, I was like trying to figure out how, how I would answer that question. And I think I would agree. Um, okay. Oh, um, so Ellen also mentioned that um, people might want to read a book, uh, Jennifer Rapp's Origin. Um, she does ancient DNA and looks at uh, into teeth. So that might be a cool thing people want to check out. Je Jen so Jennifer who? Uh, Jennifer Raff, R-A-F-F. -F, and the book is called Origin. Okay. Okay, um, let's see. Scott Michaels has another question for you. So do you think mRNA vaccines will become the preferred method over traditional types of viral vaccines? And I say this knowing that the varicella vaccine is a live attenuated virus and not an mRNA vaccine. Yes, but okay. I've been wondering why no one made a attenuated COVID. Um, and then someone told me, oh, that's the Chinese one, which is known to be pretty, not very good. So uh, I think the... The, um, the, the advantage of mRNA, of course, is that all you have to do is change the sequence and you get a new, a new antigen. And so I think that's just going to, you know, blow, you know, keep being, be the, be the thing of choice. I mean, think about the flu, right? Every year, do you know it's 500 million eggs to grow the flu virus for the vaccines every year? No, I did not. I know. Yeah. I only know it has that it's made in eggs because I have a friend that's allergic who cannot get the flu vaccine. Yeah, for that yeah I mean, I mean, one egg only does like two, two or three doses. Wow. And, okay. I mean, so there are chickens out there somewhere <laughs> who are laying five hundred million eggs just for the U.S. That's um, incredible. Yeah. So having something other than that surely has got to be better, especially since you know the, it has to cha get changed every year because of new new. Um, variants pop up. So I, I, the one thing I wonder about is why mRNA, why not protein? You know, so the Synrex was protein. You know, so I, I, you know, I'm not totally convinced that we should stick to mRNA instead, as opposed to, you know, having, a, having a bacteria make the protein purifying it and using that. Sure. But I do think it's, I do think it's certainly the wave of uh, uh, the wave of the present. <laughs> I agree. I also hope that that's true because that is something that my lab is also looking at right now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> RNA vaccine. So selfishly, I agree. Um, all right. So Peter has a question. Uh, the isolation of the 1919 Spanish flu virus was considered a monumental breakthrough. Um, can you tell us anything about how they actually were able to isolate that? I don't know if you know specifically. I certainly don't remember. Um, but I think they made it. Oh, they um, I, ha I, I used to know, I, I'm sure, you know, I wrote, a, I wrote, I've written two articles about, about flu. Uh, I, I, I think, I think they deduced the genome and they actually made it. I know that, I know they, that somebody was doing gain of function um, to, to, um, to prove that it was what it was. And that, that was highly controversial. 
but I don't think it was isolated. Uh, all the, the current existing uh, flu samples are only um, date back about 30 years. Wow, okay. So certainly not all the way back to 1990. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 and actually it's controversial that they exist at all. I mean, there was a, whole, a, a there were a lot of people who thought that the uh, those should all be destroyed. But anyway, there they are. I was going to say, at this point, you can if you want to make a virus, as long as you know what it what its genome looks like, you can make it. <laughs> uh, Karen Bush uh, has a comment about uh, the bacteria versus virus conversation we were having. So oh, yeah? Karen says, "Great seminar. I agree that bacteria have shown that they can." that they can continue to evade antibiotics even when new drugs are tailored to treat specific pathogens. They, uh, Karen would also bet on the bacteria, so yeah. we're in good company. Uh, Alex uh, has a question about the eggs. Uh, so is there a special characteristic of eggs that are used for creating vaccines or will any chicken egg do? Oh, it has to be fertile. Uh, <laughs> so, so there's gotta be roosters involved somewhere. Uh, um, but other than that, I mean, they obviously there's this is a big you know, industry of I mean, because they have to be they have to be, you know, se aseptic. Um, and other than that, I think there's you know it's just it's it's a it's a just a fertile egg, and because because the virus the virus actually grows in the embryo. Um, other than that, I think it's just an egg. I'm going to ask you a question about IU, since we are at an IU seminar that has many alumni in the audience. So um, from, from, a, from, a, from your scientific side, what does IU mean to you? Like what, um, what maybe a cool thing that you discovered while, while here or really anything that, that makes IU special? Well, I think what IU did for, you know, for me, I, mean, I, I moved to IU from Boston University Medical School. So I was in a, a urban medical school. And I don't know if people out there have been in medical school, but it's a very different atmosphere. And what I discovered when I, I came to IU are colleagues. I mean, you know, supportive, interactive, um, collegial colleagues, some of whom, you know, I could directly um, collaborate with on projects. And, and also, um, you know, just terrific graduate students. And, undergraduates and a community. So, I mean, I, you know, it's it's not exactly the same as saying, oh, you know, it was just the science. It was also the way the science is done at IU. I mean, I, I, my colleagues are great scientists, but the way it's done at IU is just, it, it, it's, it, it makes you happy and it makes you productive. So that's what IU meant to me. And also living in Bloomington as opposed to Boston. Yeah, it's definitely a different different life for sure. Yeah. Um, I actually, I also went to Boston University, so that's funny. I didn't oh, really? <laughs> yeah, but you, you weren't at the medical school, though, right? No, 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 no. I was never destined for medical school. Um, I love viruses, but I mostly love studying the virus and less about the disease that they cause. Um, so that's more more my speed. Well, I sort of ended up there accidentally. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, I, I I, you know, my, my, my uh, research is relevant to cancer. And uh, so yeah. I, I was I was funded by the National Cancer Institute for many years. So yeah, that's how I ended up in medical school. That makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. I want to tell people why it's called chicken pox. Oh yes, please tell people why it's called chicken pox. I actually wrote that down and forgot that. Right. Okay, so there's two possibilities. One, well, three actually. One is, well, there are actually two. Sorry, take it back. There's two. One is that it's like wimpy smallpox. Right, it's like it's not like it's not as bad as smallpox, and so it's a chicken smallpox, right? So that's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility is from an old English Anglo-Saxon word, "shinken," meaning itchy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so it might just be a bad translation. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so. Uh, I will, I'll ask one more question just because we have another five minutes and I'm now curious too. So smallpox, um, there definitely was a time when, again, when before the vaccination existed that they noticed that farmhands, particularly women and men that worked in dairy, um, were not as susceptible to severe smallpox. Um, and it's because they thought it was because maybe they contracted this thing called cowpox, which was similar, but not as severe in humans. And maybe that helped protect them against the severity of smallpox. And so now I'm like, 
the people if you work with a chicken this, i don't think that there's any correlation between the name and, and the fact that it's a chicken i do oh. find it very ironic though that they do make this vaccine in chicken eggs mm -hmm. um but i i yeah i'm just curious if there's any evidence that there's sort of like a similar virus that people can get that maybe helps promote immunity to chicken pox i not that i know of remember this there's thing about uh them being so highly evolved for a host and one of the things they're involved to do in that host is to manipulate the immune system and so um you know i i don't i don't think it's that easy it's not that simple yeah <laughs> to, to pass this particular virus from one species to another yeah that makes sense unless there's anything else um ted would like to thank you for the amazing seminar as well as roger now they're okay. all popping in all right um, thank you guys for tuning in Great. Thank you again so much for attending this evening's live stream. I would like to thank Professor Foster and Ms. Doucette for their time and energy in making tonight's program a success. I would also like to acknowledge the work of the IU Alumni Association and its members for assisting with tonight's program. Finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support of donors who understand the value of a liberal arts education. Um, at Indiana University. If you would like to support the faculty, students, and programs of the College of Arts and Sciences, please consider making a contribution to the Arts and Sciences Priority Fund at the Indiana University Foundation. Until next time, please take care and stay safe. Thank you again.